Good evening and welcome to Copernic Observatory. My name is Drew Desker. I'm the director here. It's great, uh, great to have you with us uh, this evening. And um, I apologize for those people watching on the, uh, uh, not for, I apologize to the people watching on the live stream uh, starting late. Um, the, the opportunity to do any uh, nighttime observing was, uh, wasn't looking good, but uh, literally just before we were about to start our program this evening, uh, the sky sort of opened up. We were able to uh, to get the, the people here to see Venus, and so uh, through one of our scopes. So, uh, uh, we, as I always say, we you know we have a rule here that you can't leave Copernic until you look through a scope. So uh, you guys are good to go, but only after the program. Anyway, um, it's good to see some uh, some new faces here. Uh, by show of hands, who's here for the first time? Wow. Okay, a good number of people. Uh, for those people who didn't raise their hand uh, first, uh, who here are members? Oh, the, the other half. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, well, the people that raise their hand second have a particularly valuable piece of knowledge. And uh, being a Copernic member, um, it not only gets you into Copernic uh, you know, on, on, on any uh, Friday night and for certain special events, but also we belong to what's called the ASTC, Association of Science and Technology Centers, and it's a consortium of over 350 other science centers that will honor a Copernic membership for admission. So if you like this kind of place, a Copernic membership for like for a family is $75. Yes, you have a question? Um, we would have to look on, the, uh, I, I don't know for sure what's, what they have out there, but if we go to the ASTC, they have what's called the Passport Program, asking about a particular uh, 
museum in, in Las Vegas, and we could look up and, uh, and see whether that's that's part of it. And uh, so again, for seventy-five dollars, you can come here for a year, but you could go to any of these other three hundred and fifty uh, science centers. Uh, they include the Intrepid down in New York City or the Franklin Institute down in um, in Philly, where a family would spend more than seventy-five dollars just for the one day. Copernica is actually closing in on our 50th anniversary. We actually opened our doors in 1974, and um, we are an informal STEM education center. We do uh, school outreach, school programs. Uh, we do an extensive summer camp program. We do uh, other programs throughout the year. Uh, and we are, uh, every Friday night from March to mid-December, we do one of these Friday night programs. And it's, uh, it's about a wide range of topics. It isn't always about astronomy, as you'll see tonight is not about astronomy. Um, but back in 2020, uh, in March of 2020, uh, when COVID hit and we basically had to shut everything down like everybody else did, we said, all right, well, we'll just, you know, we had all of our speakers lined up. We'll just wait a couple of weeks, let this thing blow over, and then we'll be back to working again. And well, clearly that didn't play out. So by May of that, uh, that year, we decided, well, look, we have all these speakers lined up. Why don't we try live streaming? We'd have them zoom into us here, and then we could then turn it back around and put it on our YouTube channel. So for those of you who are watching on our YouTube channel, you know this. Um, we now have over 13,000 subscribers to our YouTube channel. Uh, along with our Friday night programs, we do some uh, reaction programs where we might live stream uh, a launch from uh, uh, from Kennedy or or, uh, or return of the like when one of the local astronauts returned on the SpaceX Crew Dragon, we followed that and uh, had sort of a reaction time. But we also do live streaming of uh, observing sessions. So we've done of comets, of meteor showers, of um, of eclipses, and um, uh, actually the a lunar eclipse that was last May. Uh, we had at one point over twenty five thousand people on our uh, on our YouTube channel. Uh, commenting the uh, as I like to say the the chat stream was flying by like a CVS receipt um, but along with um, uh, our YouTube channel which again we decided you know it's been so popular we, we continue to do it uh, in fact last week we had somebody from Adelaide Australia watching our, our program um, and they're here you know, welcome, welcome Adelaide good morning good day I guess it's the official terminology there anyway um, but we do other we do other programs uh, coming up. Um, actually, a week from tomorrow is our 5K race. It's we call it Race to the Stars. It starts at 7 p.m. So if you're a runner or even if you walk, you can come uh, and support us. And basically, we don't make you go down the steep hill you just drove up. We we send you down a, a more gentle sloping area. Uh, it's an out and back. And then um, also in June, we just announced our uh, this is our 14th Rocket Fest, where families will build. Uh, one of those. Uh, let's get this going. Put your presentation up, and here you go. Great, thanks, Drew. All right, sounds like I got audio. Cool. All right, um, let's get started here. I'm going to set the scene here. It's the Battle of New Orleans, at the tail end of the War of 1812. It's January of 1815. I. I didn't want to bother with audio stuff, so I don't. I, I don't. I was going to have like audio effects, so I'll, you know, boom, bam. Okay. So anyway, <laughs> this was a a massive, massive battle. Um, Seventy-one Americans killed, over two thousand British killed. Um, this was just like this humongous battle, and General Andrew Jackson of the U.S. Army um, won over the British. And this made him famous. And General Andrew Jackson eventually went on to become President Andrew Jackson. Um, the after the is that oh, okay? Yeah. I mean, he was massively. Ma I, this made him uh, into an American icon. There's only one problem with this battle. It was fought two weeks after the war ended. <laughs> the Treaty of Ghent had been signed. The war was over. But they didn't know that because back then. It took weeks or months for news to travel. Uh, this treaty was signed in Europe. It was probably like two, three weeks at least before Americans even knew the war was over. So they were fighting and killing each other over a war. It never needed to happen. But that's how it was back then. Um, 
This is before the telegraph was invented. And um, telegraphy, um, I, um, I just want to you know, talk briefly about the telegraph because it's the precursor to the technology that this Marconi Tower was uh, a successor to. Uh, the telegraph was developed in the early 1800s in Europe, um, but the first models were really impractical. There was a whole, it, a whole bunch of needles and magnetic fields, and you, would, you had five wires going to five needles, and then you'd like, the needles would all move around according to the magnetic fields you generated, and you had to interpret the little patterns of needles to figure out what letters it spelled out. Um, so this was, was not really a huge deal. What was a huge deal was the telegraph that we know that was invented by Samuel F.B. Morse of Morse code fame. Um, his system used one wire, a lot easier that way, and that came into uh, being in the mid-1800s. And initially, it was adopted right away by the railroads, um, and that was primarily because they had a problem on the railroads. Sometimes one station would send a train down the track, and another station, like 60 miles away, would send a train in the opposite direction on the same track. And that's a real problem. They didn't have the ability to communicate in real time about this. And there were train wrecks because this kind of thing happened. When they adopted the telegraphs in the, radio, or the railroad stations, they could communicate with each other, hey, we got a train coming through. Don't be sending one this way. You know, so this was uh, pretty revolutionary. As a matter of fact, when it started becoming uh, a more broadly used tool for things like telegrams and stuff like that. This was as big a deal as the internet is today. It, it was the instant messaging service of its time. You could instantly send messages, you know, vast distances, and nothing like that had ever been known before. You know, before messages traveled at the speed of a runner or a horse, you know, and that was it. Because uh, we're talking about the days before, you know, steam cars. You know, they, they, you know, so it, it was just uh, unbelievable how revolutionary the introduction of the telegraph was. Um, the telegraph and then the telephone uh, started becoming pretty widespread around the turn of the 20th century. And what happened was because all communications happened through wires, you had these tangles of wires throughout the cities. Now, it wasn't always this bad. This is like a worst case scenario here. But this did exist in some places in some cities, New York, Chicago and stuff. These crazy tangles of wires because this was the only way to communicate instantaneously at the time. Um, and this was a pretty well known problem. As a matter of fact, it was, um, there was an ad, a, a, a Western Bell ad. Uh, was it Western Bell? Or, uh, oh yeah, uh, it's a 1935 Bell Telephone ad, um, which was a parody saying, yeah, this is the way things used to be. Now, you know, our telephones are so much better, you know. So this was a real issue. So a hero steps in to solve some of these problems. That's, I hope I can pronounce it correctly, Guglielmo Marconi. He's got a very Italian name. I, I think I got it right. Marconi was born in Italy in 1874 to uh, Italian aristocracy. Uh, his dad was an aristocrat. His mom was uh, Irish, actually, and the granddaughter of John Jameson. Anyone heard of Jameson whiskey? That Jameson. So a lot of money in this family. Uh, he lived in England uh, growing up, and he didn't go to public school. They brought in private tutors. They had a lot of money. So they were like, you come to our house, and you teach our son. Um, so he got a decent education at home and started getting into electricity and stuff pretty early. Science and electricity really captivated him at a pretty young age. And by 1894, when he was 20 years old, he was um, already experimenting with radio waves. Radio waves had only been discovered six years before by Heinrich Hertz. We now measure frequencies in hertz and kilohertz and megahertz. They're named after the guy that actually discovered radio waves. It was assumed at that time that radio waves were pretty much like light waves. So radio waves probably, they figured, went about as far as you could see. There was a really famous British physicist. His name was uh, Lodge, uh, uh, Oliver Lodge. Uh, his <coughs> estimate at the time, his, his um, learned um, expertise said that 
radio, radio waves could probably travel about half a mile. That would probably be the limit, he figured. Um, Marconi um, was really interested in, in pursuing this, uh, the use of these radio waves. It was seen at the time as a curiosity. Nobody thought that radio waves or something you could do anything really useful with. It was kind of like another kind of light. It would be about as useful as a flashlight to send radio waves out. But Marconi realized that uh, radio waves might have a use. And um, he invented the first device ever to use radio waves. He had a button on one side of a room and a bell on the other side. And when you push the button, the bell would ring. I, I could see you're overwhelmed here with the, how technologically amazing that is. Now, it does not sound amazing, but at the time, this was unbelievably incredible. I mean, nobody had ever, think about this. The ability to control something at a distance with invisible powers, back then, that was called witchcraft, you know? That's, uh, you know, there were, so this was like unbelievably extraordinary. So you'd think he's going to capture the world by storm with this technology. Well, not really. Um, uh, he, he kept you know, developing this technology, figuring he was going to make a lot of money on it and all. Um, he did figure out, I mean, that was across a room. That wasn't a big deal yet. But he did figure out that if you put a, an aerial up, or an antenna, a wire antenna, and hooked it up to some apparatus and then grounded the other side, you could get your radio waves to go further. He managed, uh, within a year, to get radio waves traveling two miles over hills. So, so much for Oliver Lodge's idea. So, you'd think, okay, now he's got it clinched, right? No, the Italian authorities were like, we don't know what you're up to, but we think it's a bunch of hokum and we're not buying into him. So, he's like, to heck with you guys, I'm moving to England. <laughs> you know? He went to England where there was a lot of scientists that were working on stuff like this, and they, they were really more uh, receptive to his ideas. Um, so throughout the 1890s, uh, he just continued to develop and improve this equipment. Um, he managed to, in 1899, just a few years after this uh, demonstration with the button and the bell, he managed a trans uh, 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 across the English Channel communications, which is you know like some twenty something miles or so. He just you know every year he's just getting better and better, and that's a big deal that France and England would be able to communicate directly like that instead of you know putting a message on a ship and sending it over the channel and stuff. Um, and uh, within the year, uh, the first distressed signal from a ship to shore was sent out. There was this uh, light ship called the uh, East Goodwin. A, a light ship is like a lighthouse, but it's like on a barge, you know, in the bay. Uh, this light ship had some kind of problem, and they sent a message to um, the South Foreland Lighthouse in Dover, England, and they received the uh, uh, the message. So um, at that point, Marconi's like, "All right, I've crossed the channel. Now I'm going to get radio waves to travel across the ocean." A lot of skeptics here. You know, he's going to have. He was going to have to have a pretty convincing uh, demonstration. In 1901, uh, he set up stations in Newfoundland and in Ireland and uh, had one transmit. And the people in Ireland were like, yeah, we think you'd hear it. What, what they was, they're listening to static, right? And this radio transmitter, th th we're not talking about people talking into a microphone. This is Morse code with a key, beep, 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 beep. But it wasn't even beeps. They were just making these big sparks and picking up all the static that came off the sparks. So they had to hear, listen with primitive radio equipment. They're listening to static, and they're trying to hear the different static that the Morse code keys were sending. So all they did was they, over and over and over, they sent three dots, which is S in Morse code, dit, 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 dit. So they're listening, and they're like, the static, and they're like, yeah, yeah, we, we think we heard it. We think we heard it. And a lot of people are like, yeah, maybe not, right? So he had to improve the equipment a little bit more. Um, the next year, it was obviously definitely clear that he was getting his little dots across the Atlantic Ocean from Newfoundland to Ireland. So it was settled. You could send radio waves you know, over the ocean and maybe even around the world. Um, 
that started to bring him some um, acclaim. Um, It was such a low, f those spark gap generators generate such low frequencies that probably now it's probably just following the curvature of the ocean. I think it was ground waves. You know, I don't think those, the, we're talking like, are you familiar with radio waves? Like, no, no, but radio waves can hug the curvature of land and water and actually, you know, so that's probably what was happening there. You, you can at higher frequencies. That's what this gentleman was asking about. That's not what was happening here, though. Um, like, you can, yeah, you can hear AM stations uh, at night, like 100, 200, 300 miles away, and that's not necessarily skipping off the atmosphere. Sometimes it's just because, you know, sometimes it is, sometimes it's because it's just following the curvature of the Earth. Um, but yeah, they weren't generating frequencies high enough to do that. Um, but, I mean, he did manage to talk across the Atlantic. Was that a big deal? Yeah, but what was even a bigger deal was in 1912, the Titanic went down. Um, and a few years later, the Lusitania went down. Incredible loss of lives, right? But hundreds of people were saved. And it was only because the Titanic had a radio room and they got an SOS out. And the, uh, and the uh, Carpathia, SS Carpathia, had a radio, and they picked it up, and they steamed over there, and they picked hundreds of people out of the water. Well, a, most of the credit for this amazing feat of saving these people went to Marconi. So now he was super, super famous. And um, uh, within a few years, he had won the Nobel Prize for physics. He established a company called the Marconi Company, and um, they did experiments all over the world, including here in Binghamton. Um, they grew and they grew and then they, you know, when they, they, they had all different divisions and stuff like that. Um, the, the company pretty much went bankrupt in uh, 2006 um, and the assets were acquired by a Swedish company called Ericsson. They're a telecommunications firm. Uh, if you're of an age, you might have owned a flip phone, an Ericsson flip phone. They, they made a lot of early cell phones. I, I don't know where they are now. Um, they don't seem to be on the market, but you know, I, I think our first uh, phone was an Ericsson, actually, our very first uh, track phone. You know? so, but prior to this, um, their electronics division, uh, Marconi Electronics, merged with British Aerospace in England, and they became BAE. We have BAE right here in Endicott. That's where I work, actually. Um, that's not the building I work in, but that's the main, uh, the main entrance there. Um, so uh, Marconi, an amazing legacy through the 20th century. He died in 63, at, at age 63 in 1937. Italy had this massive state funeral. They're like, oh, now. He was Italian, like now they're really in, oh yeah, Marconi, he was Italian, he's a big hero and all, you know, they kind of poo-pooed him before, but now he's this massive Italian hero, he's on the money and everything, you know, um, and they've, you know, I think he's got this massive, thing. yeah. Yeah, oh, he was 63, and he passed away in 1937. Mm -hmm. So his company was responsible for doing an amazing little experiment here in Binghamton that I'll get into. But first, I want to go off on a little tangent about somebody else that was actually here and involved. I, I never found out if Mark Coney himself stepped foot in this area. I mean, he had this huge corporation. I suspect it was his corporate folks that you know took care of all this stuff. But David Sarnoff was here. He's a pretty amazing character in the history of radio. He, at the time, was the chief inspector of the Marconi Wireless <laughs> Telegraph Company. And um, his idea that he put out there was like, hey, we're, we're doing all this communications and all. We could use this for entertainment purposes, you know, put it out to the people and all. And the Marconi company was like, no, we're, we're a business company. We don't think that's going to fly. Like, people are not going to want to have to deal with building radio equipment and stuff like that. So another guy who had these amazing ideas that was like, no, we don't think so, you know. So... Uh, Actually, he did go on to become this pioneer of radio and television eventually. Um, at one point, GE acquired American Marconi, and uh, it got rebranded as the Radio Corporation of America, RCA. 
And with David Sarnoff as its president, he created another division of that, the National Broadcasting Corporation, NBC. That was totally his baby. Um, Sarnoff was instrumental in building out the AM uh, broadcast station network. He built you know, all the original AM stations across the country for broadcasting. You know, the whole idea of broadcasting for entertainment was his idea. And he was the one who introduced television at the 1939 World's Fair, the very first public demonstration of television. And he instituted the very first regularly scheduled television broadcasts. Um, he was here um, as part of this experiment. Uh, this experiment took place between Scranton and Binghamton. I think he was actually in the Scranton station, if I remember correctly. But uh, yeah, he's a, a big deal, and he was part of this. So let me talk about this experiment and the Marconi Tower that was part of it. Um, the Marconi Tower is down on Lewis Street. It's uh, right, right next to the, uh, the baseball stadium. I don't know what they call the stadium. Is it the nice? No, it used to be the nice egg station now. I mean, the. the Marabito, that's it, the Marabito, um, uh Stadium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's an old train station there that's now offices. It's right in front of that old train station. And there's a little um, brick building right next to it. Um, it used to be an old power, a steam powerhouse. It's like an ice cream place now. I've never been there for ice cream, but maybe they'll be open tomorrow when we're out there. <laughs> That'd be nice. And um, the whole idea of this experiment was to demonstrate that you could communicate wirelessly with radios to a fast moving train. Up until this point, radio was only used at fixed locations like radio stations and on board ships that were moving pretty slowly. Marconi thought, hey, you know, right now they're relying on all these wires and stuff to communicate. Maybe we just put radios on the trains, you know, and then eventually maybe put radios on cars and things like that. And once again, everyone's like, yeah, no, that's probably not going to work. You know, you're going to have all these shifts and frequencies because you're moving too quickly, and you can't fit the equipment on, you know, on a mobile platform. So, you know, once again, it was it was time for him to try and prove everybody wrong. Um, the tower was constructed in 1913, and there were two stations set up, as I mentioned, one in Scranton, one here. Each station had a pair of towers, and there were big wire radials in between the two ta in the between the pair of towers. This was, and again, when I say radial, I'm talking about, you know, or aerial, I'm talking about an antenna. But it, it doesn't look like the kind of antenna you're used to seeing. It's a bunch of wires, right? But this was the antenna of the day. Uh, the towers were 150 feet apart. Uh, in Binghamton, there's the one that's still standing by the the train station, and the other one was over by the uh, the, the the old Kilmer building where uh, Remlix is right now. Um, that one's gone, and then you had two in Scranton as well. Um, I've seen all sorts of heights listed for these things. Um, the official height of the tower was listed as 97 feet. There's some articles at the time that say it was 130 foot or even 135 foot tower and all. I think that's because the tower itself was probably 97 feet, and then there was these poles that the wires were suspended them. That was probably like the extra 30, 40 feet on top of that. So of the four towers, there's just one left, the one in Binghamton. Most of these kinds of things were scrapped out for, uh, for their scrap metal value, like during World War I and World War II. Uh, so it's pretty remarkable that for some reason this one was spared. I have no idea why. There is an historic marker there, but it's, um, it's not an official historic marker that the state put up or anything. This is one that, uh, there's a guy that used to have a local radio TV repair place over on Clinton Street, and he was really uh, a fan of this tower, just like I am. And he had the, he had the sign made. Um, I actually started life as an archaeologist, and I used to do some National Register uh, nominations, and I know for a fact this tower would be eligible for the National Register, but uh, it's a lot of work to get it done, and you need the cooperation of the landowner. I don't think we'd have any particular interest. There'd be nothing in it for him except to have to maintain this thing. So uh, it's probably not going to happen. So as of now, there's not much protection in place for this historic uh, treasure, unfortunately. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the, the equipment that they were using here. Um, in the train station itself, they had the base station there. Uh, the power 
came from a 2,000 watt generator. And the power from the generator was actually sent through the key that the Morse code, the guy that was sending the Morse code, that 2,000 watts was going through that key. So you had to be really careful you weren't touching the wrong thing, you know? You just grab the edge of that key and send your Morse code and don't be touching any of the metal because it was crazy power. Then the 2,000 watts, because that wasn't enough. It, this is primitive radio. They had to put that through a transformer that stepped it up to even higher power to make these big sparks. And again, there was no way of really tuning these things very efficiently. Like nowadays, you, you tune a radio to 91.5 or 89.3 or whatever station. They couldn't really tune it that finely. They, they, these sparks just made this noise all over the radio band, and you kind of just focused in on that part of the radio band and picked up this noise. For those of you who know something about radio, the frequency was 187 kilohertz, which is known as long wave. It's down below the AM uh, broadcast band, which is a very low frequency. And then in the train, they uh, tapped off uh, the batteries. They had 1,000 watts of battery capability uh, for, the, for the lighting. So they just tapped into that to use for the radio equipment. And the radio equipment filled up like a whole train car. It was kind of like when you hear about computers in the 1950s, fill, you know, one computer filled a whole room. This was like one radio filled a whole train car kind of thing. Um, the antenna on the radio, uh, on the train, was um, they put these poles up, sticking up from the train cars, and ran a wire four train cars long, and then across, and then four train cars back and around again to where they started. Um, this was not very practical. This was just an experiment. This is not how they were going to do it permanently because those poles stuck up a good ways. And you might have obstructions like tunnels and overhead wires and things like that. Um, and these poles would get nailed if you had that. So this really wasn't the final solution. Somebody, uh, I gave this presentation a couple nights ago. And someone asked me, why Binghamton? Why did they come to Binghamton to do this? And I really didn't have a good answer, although I suspect that one of the reasons, probably a bunch of reasons, one of them was probably that the Scranton to Binghamton line didn't have any of those obstructions, so they knew they could use that for their experiment. So they trans uh, the train started in Scranton, and the, the station in Scranton talked to the folks on the train. Again, not really talk. Morse code, beep, beep, beep communication. Uh, until the train got about halfway between Scranton and Binghamton, and then they switched to communicating with the, the Binghamton station. Um, so, did it actually work? Un phenomenally well. They received um, 350 words of news uh, accurately while they were aboard the train, and the accolades just went out. It was reported in all the press and everything, especially the scientific press. They were like, once again, Marconi pulled off this amazing feat that no one thought was possible. Um, so it's just wicked success. You know, totally, totally worked, just like you'd hoped. They did some follow-up experiments, and um, there was just one success after another. There was a couple of incidents where it turned out to be really helpful. There was one where the conductor got sick uh, on a train. Buffalo is a Buffalo to Scranton, um, and they were able to radio ahead and say, "Hey." have a replacement conductor ready uh, because our guy's sick and he, someone else is going to need to jump on here and uh, drive the train. That was really helpful. What would have happened before they had the ability to communicate? The train would have pulled up. They'd be like, hey, our conductor's sick. And they'd be like, all right, we'll send some people out to start looking for a conductor. And the train would be hung up for hours. So they were all like, oh, this is amazing. And then there was this other incident where um, uh, some equipment broke down on uh, uh, one of the train uh, cars, and they radioed ahead and said, hey, have a replacement car ready to go. So they were able to roll in, swap out the car, and seamlessly move on. And they, again, they weren't hung up for hours like they would have been. So this idea of communicating wireless just totally caught on real quickly. Um, now, of course, wireless communication, we just take it for granted. And there's radio waves running all through us from everything from AM, FM, TV stations to police radio and aircraft radio, Wi-Fi and, and cell phone signals, like everything operates. Your garage door opener operates on wireless signals, you know? That would have been amazing to somebody 100 years ago. You push a button and your garage door opens. That'd be like magic, you know? 
Uh, we just totally take it for granted now that we use these invisible powers to, to you know, for our benefit. So the Binghamton Amateur Radio Association, a bunch of amateur radio operators, also known as ham radio operators, uh, we have a club. We meet right here, um, third Wednesday of every month. And uh, some years back, I heard about this event that celebrated Marconi by setting up radio, ham radio stations at um, different locations associated with Marconi's life and his works and stuff. And they all tried to, you know, and then the, it was like a contest to see how many of these you could uh, contact. And I was like, hey, we have a Marconi thing here in town. Um, maybe I'll take my radio and head downtown and just, as a goof, operate from the Marconi Tower, you know, and talk to people and say, hey, I'm a, a Marconi Tower. And then I mentioned it to the club, and they're all like, yeah, we're in. We want to do this. So a whole bunch of us went there and did it, and um, we had a great time. This uh, event, the International Marconi Day, is held uh, on the closest Saturday to Marconi's birthday every year. His birthday was on April 25th. Um, so um, it's uh, stations all over the world that are participating. Um, there are, uh, you can register as an official station, and there's over 60 official stations. You know, places like his birthplace and where he went to, you know, where he went to, you know, where his labs were and where his offices were and things like that. And um, our participation is, uh, is part of that. Now, we're an official station. Um, what we do is we got, with the help of the fire department, we get a, a big long wire up um, pretty high up on the tower. And we use this wire antenna uh, hooked up to several ham radios to, uh, as our station. Um, and we do have a couple other uh, antennas that we put up as well, just so we can have as many stations operating as possible. Ham radio operates in different portions of the radio spectrum. And you want to be able to like check them all out to see which one's doing the best. So far, we started this in 20, let's see, 2017, 20, no, 2012. This would be the seventh year we're doing it. We only skipped one year. So whatever eight years ago was, I'm not that great at math, even though I work in electronics. And um, so, so far every year, the weather's been either usually kind of crappy. It's usually like cold and rainy and stuff. And the radio conditions, you know, whether you can get stations from far away or not. This is called propagation, how radio waves are bouncing off the ionosphere or traveling or whatever. Conditions have always been really lame. We contact a handful of stations. We endure the cold. But we have a really good time. Um, and that's part of that is because um, this is a really good exercise. Ham radio operators um, have several different emergency preparedness exercises each year. Um, because when the power goes out for an extended period or you have a disaster or something like that and it wipes out communications, the ham radio operators are the ones that establish the vital links. And you think, ah, well, if the power goes out, I got my cell phone. You know, the cell phone towers have batteries and all. Those batteries are good for 24 to 48 hours, and then the cell network is down. So you got to have some kind of backup system. So ham radio operators are really keen on practicing for emergencies. There's an annual event every June called Field Day where million, millions, no, tens of thousands, at least probably tens of thousands of ham radio operators around the world all operate, um, most of them on like emergency power. They often go to a field or a park or something like that. And they turn into a big contest. There's like official, official uh, entities that you can send in like proof of how many stations you contact. And everyone's like, oh, wants to get the most stations and stuff. This event is more laid back. It's, it's not a contest. It's just for fun of it, you know? But it is really good uh, for practicing emergency communications. I went out there one year with my radio, but I forgot the microphone. <laughs> and I went out there the next year with my radio with the microphone, but I forgot the power supply. <laughs> like, so I've been learning a lot, you know? It's, you, you totally learn. You do it time and time and time again. You're like, you, you learn. You need the extension cords. You need the extra antenna wire in case your antenna wire breaks. You learn what it takes to set up an emergency uh, radio station in the field. You know? So it's very helpful for that. This event lasts a full 24 hours, but we usually operate um, from like 9 in the morning. We get there about 8. We usually set up by about 9. 
And we've typically gone till like three o'clock in the afternoon or so, and then everyone's had enough of the cold and the not making contacts and all. But um, tomorrow, there is a 50% chance of rain, but temperature-wise, it's going to be good. And we are under a shelter, so we don't have to worry about rain. And lately, um, the radio conditions have been really, really good. So we're thinking we're probably going to contact a lot of stations. And being one of the official Marconi stations, there'll be people calling us. They're going to really want to get a hold of us because they want to try and rack up, you know, they turn it into a personal contest, rack up as many stations as you can. I treat the ham radio hobby as a personal contest. I'm, I've got list, you know, I've got a spreadsheet where I'm like, how can I get all the states like officially verified? How many countries can I get? You know. Um, things like that. It's my own personal little contest thing. And so, you know, we're, we're not going to, you know, I think the stations will be coming to us. I don't think we're going to have to reach out much. I think people will be calling us, hopefully. So then when we're all done, um, I post uh, photos of the event and our logs. We keep track of all the stations that we've contacted uh, in a log book, and we post those. I have a website where I post this all to, and it's part of a larger website that I've set up to document uh, uh, the Marconi Tower. Um, it's, uh, I have the URL up there, but you don't really need to remember it or write it down. If you uh, Google Marconi Tower Binghamton, it comes up as the first, uh, the first one. And if you don't even remember how to spell Marconi, if you Google Macaroni Binghamton Tower, it still comes up as the first one. So it's easy enough to find it. Yeah. So, and if you're interested, I have more technical details up there about you know the radio stations and the equipment and stuff. And then there was um, a bunch of uh, scientific articles that went into detail about the experiments. I've got copies of those posted there too. Um, so yeah, if there's anything more you want to know, it's probably up there. But I'd be happy to take any questions you have about this. Nope. No. Nope. But there established. Pair of towers and trains. Yes. So Each pair of towers was established to talk to the train. They figured they could make it midway between Scranton and Binghamton and then switch to the other station. Talk to the trains that were going in other directions for the ways. Well, this was an experiment. There was only a radio aboard this one train going from Scranton to Binghamton for this experiment. <laughs> four cars of antennas. And, yeah, the radio was a whole car and then four cars of antenna wire. Yeah, it was totally an experiment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If yeah, either lead acid or they might have even been. Um, yeah, yeah, they probably were lead acid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well, yeah. I'm gonna take my microphone so that people on the live stream can hear it as well. Oh yeah, okay. With the improvement in the sunspot cycle, you should have much better propagation tomorrow. Yes, that's when I said lately radio conditions have been really good. Yeah, well, the last few years that we did it, the sun, yeah, the sunspots. Uh, we're not that active. And for those of you who are not aware, which is probably most of you, sunspots actually affect how radio waves uh, bounce around and stuff. In the bands that, you won't notice this with an FM radio. You, you, know, you might notice it a little bit with an AM radio at night. You won't see it on TV or anything, but amateur radio operators make use of the capability of radio waves to bounce off layers uh, uh, of the atmosphere, called the ionosphere. And um, there's there's lower levels that are activated when the sun's shining and the radio waves take little hops. But at night, those lower levels kind of dissolve and they just leave these upper levels. You can take big hops so you can talk around the world uh, by bouncing radio waves around. And these levels are, you know, are in increased uh, by the presence of sunspots. And right now, the sunspots are really high. So, um, yeah, Drew was talking about how amazing you know the conditions have been lately earlier yep. and that's why uh, the sun is not just sunspots it's solar activity uh, sunspots are a reflection of that but there's other stuff that's, that sun's giving off and stuff that affect earth's uh, what they call the magnetosphere you know where particles from the sun strike the earth and make all sorts of magnetic properties and things and yeah ham radio operators are totally on top of this we uh, I watch uh, every week I watch the uh, uh, the weather lady on YouTube, Tamitha Scove, she gives the uh, solar terrestrial report 
The, it's like a sun, it's a weather report for the sun. Here's what the sun's doing. Ooh, she gets excited too. And watch this huge flare on the western side. Boom, boom. It's like she goes off, you know. She is super into space weather. So she calls herself the space weather lady. And, and yeah. she recently got her license. She is now a, a licensed ham. That's right, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, the people that are interested in what the sun does to the earth and, and the people that are interested in ham radio is usually like almost a one-to-one -one correspondence because it's... So key apart. Now I, we, I know we got some questions on the um, in the chat. Any oh, other yeah. questions here uh, locally? Otherwise, uh, give it uh, the mic that here to Jeremy so that they can hear as well. Yep. Is there a camera somewhere? Oh, I should be looking there. <laughs> All right. Yes. A uh, question from Steve. What frequencies will you be transmitting at tomorrow? Mm -hmm. We will be all over the shortwave bands. People often say, "Hey, what frequency can I find you on so that I can contact you?" And we're like. We don't pick a frequency in advance because we don't know what the conditions are going to be like. We just get there and we set up and we start tuning around and where things are working, that's where we park our radio and start operating, you know. If we promised in advance and that frequency was dead, that would be useless. So we're going to be on all the regular shortwave or also known as HF, high frequency amateur radio bands and we're operating exclusively voice. I had hoped to have a digital radio set up using my little Raspberry Pi microcomputer and my transceiver and all, but it's been really, really, really tough to set that up to work properly. It's, it's talking about experiments, you know. This has been this crazy experiment. I'm not quite there yet. I think there might be even something wrong with my secondhand radio that's preventing me from being able to do that. So we will be operating on the voice bands using voice on shortwave. So for those of you that, um our ham radio operators or, or have access to a, a shortwave radio, uh, as Alan was saying, you know, we have certain portions of the spectrum that we can operate in, but there are other hams that are also going to be operating in that spectrum as well. So what we will try and do is, you know, uh, w once we get set up, we'll try to find a frequency that no one is currently talking on and try to sort of sit there and just call out and say, this is special event station K2M, at the Marconi Tower in Binghamton, New York, you know, listening for your call. Yeah, it's one of the downsides of picking a frequency in advance saying, hey, listen for us on 14.230. It's like you, you get all set up and you tune in and somebody else is already talking on that frequency. So we don't make time. any promises. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. At the, um, there's actually a, a website called dxsummit.com. And what you can do is if you go to DX Summit, you can then actually, you know, uh, type in a call sign. In our case, it'll be K2M. And it should list where people have heard us. Uh, and then, so if you've got a shortwave radio, you can, you can listen to it there. Uh, but again, we also invite you to come down and, uh, and, you know, be part of that. So you can actually hear us talking to the, uh, you know, to the other stations. We can even get you on the air. We can actually hand you the microphone and, uh, and you could talk to somebody across the, you know, across the country or, or even you know, in, into England. Last night I was, I, I was talking to, uh, uh, talking to a station in, in Italy, uh, I heard Estonia, I heard Kuwait. And it's all just, remember, uh, Alan, you had talked about how the, the Marconi transmitter was like two kilowatts of, of power. Yeah. We, we both run 100 watts of power with just a little wire antenna and can literally talk around the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the last few years, due to the pandemic, we were not encouraging the public to come out. But um, in previous years, we had a, a nice turnout at times. And we're hoping a bunch of people will come out this year. We'd love to demonstrate what this ham radio thing is all about. And to show off the tower itself too. I, most people have never seen this thing, or you know, never really. If they happen to drive by it on the way to the stadium, it just looks like any old metal tower, like any elect, you know, like any um, a power line tower or train tower or anything like that. They probably would have never noticed it was something special. So it's worth coming out and checking that stuff out. Uh, also, you get to find out sort of a little bit about what ham radio is about. Um, to get a ham radio license, there, there are the, right at this point, there are three levels of license. And the beginner license um, is just 30 or 35 questions. Pretty easy. Um, a little bit of electronics, a little bit of safety, a little bit of operating procedures. People as young as five years old have gotten their ham radio license. I got mine when I was 12. How about you, Alan? Uh, I was probably 16, 15 or 16, yeah. Um, it takes a little bit of studying. You have to know a few little like FCC rules and stuff. It's 
It's not like you're going to go in there cold and, and guess it your way right. It is multiple choice, but you're not going to guess it right. You know, you got to do a little study. There are also study guides out there on, on the net that actually all of the exam questions are actually listed. And so by uh, going through those guides, you can actually, you know, p pick that information up. Mm -hmm. And actually now there's a, a special uh, uh, deal, if you will. If you get your license, you can, for $25, get a really nice, what they call a handy talkie, a walkie talkie, and you'll be able to talk locally to people. And technically, you could even talk through the International Space Station. There's, uh, there's ham radio on the uh, International Space Station uh, that, that the uh, astronauts actually use from time to time when they talk to school students. We've actually done that uh, half a dozen times here at, at Copernic, where students will actually use the ham radio station here talking directly to the ham radio station aboard the International Space Matter Station. Matter of fact, they will be talking to some students tomorrow, not too far from here. We should be able to, you know about that past? We should be able to pick what, it up. The, the Virginia one? I think so. No, that was today. It was today? Yes. Oh, I missed it. I was even <laughs> off today. Oh, bummer. Yeah, I thought was, we were going to do that today. tomorrow. Oh, well, so um, much for that idea. Actually, okay. I, if, if you allow me, there's, um, mm -hmm. when we do, we've done our, 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 our program here, the, the International Space Station, we always set up our equipment and we, and we um, rehearse the kids because we can only talk to the International Space Station when it's above the horizon. At the frequencies that we talk, because, because the ISS is above the ionosphere, we have to talk on a frequency that is so high in frequency that it'll punch through the ionosphere. And so we only have at most 11 minutes from horizon to horizon when the, satellite, when the ISS is going. So we actually rehearse the kids. There's sort of actually you know, blocking that goes on so that you know, the kid is asking his questions, is that the microphone? Then when he finishes answering, he moves away. The next kid gets in front of the microphone so that when the astronaut finishes answering, boom, he's ready to, or she's ready to ask the question. And a couple of years ago, uh, we were d doing one of the, our questions, you know, our, our contacts, and one of our students asked, what happens when you sneeze during a spacewalk? <laughs> and, and so, um, he said, well, actually, that's happened twice to me. He says, usually when you're out, you know, you're out at the ISS and you're in your space, you know, in your space suit, you get a little bit of room to move around. But when you feel the sneeze coming on, what you do is you just sort of bend your head down and you sneeze down into your chest. Yeah, but, but one time, the sneeze completely caught me by surprise. All of the boogers went on the face shield. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, that has got to be the first time boogers have been part of an answer of one of these school <laughs> contacts. Mm -hmm. But also, the, the astronauts themselves actually will get on the air. When they've got free time, they will actually get on the air and talk. Uh, in my fact, my first contact was with Doug Wheelock, who is the uh, uh, astronaut that grew up in Windsor. We were actually up here on a Friday night uh, program, and um, I was showing another ham that was visiting from out of town, uh, the station that we have here. And so I turned the radio on. It just happened to be tuned to the right frequency. And there's Doug Wheelock just giving out contacts. So I said, oh my gosh, so I have to get the, in, you know, the antenna rotors going. And, and so I, I called up, this is K2ZRO at Copernic Observatory. He says, oh, Copernic, hey, it's great. To, and, and Doug's been here a couple of times. So it was just really nice to have that, uh, that connection. Yeah, you have a question? That's kind of funny because I was just about to ask you something about that. About, about what? My uncle. Uh, Doug, we like your that, uncle? The picture back there. Wow. There's next to the rocket. Yes. Yeah, that, that's Doug, him. That's you. That's oh. All right. We, we've got a celebrity right here. Wow. All right. Uh -huh. Doug is an extraordinary uh -huh. speaker. He was actually um, uh, about ten, about nine years ago. We had our, our 40th anniversary, and Doug was our keynote speaker. And he just kept people completely enthralled for an hour and a half. And it was like, oh, please don't stop. You know, it was yeah. uh, mm -hmm. it was just great. Yeah. Uh, Were there any other questions? Oh, I'm for sorry. Folks online. Uh, not that I see. Right. Okay. Okay. Any any other questions or comments? Oh, we got one. What, what time tomorrow? Starting hopefully by 9, if all our equipment comes together properly and people don't forget their power supplies and stuff. Yeah. But, uh, Through yeah. at least till 3. And, you know, and if, if conditions are good and people feel like, you know, going, we'll, we'll go until... Um, Maybe 4. You know, they're, they're tired of talking. Uh, yeah. It does, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we, to, to talk for 3 or 4 or 5 hours, it, uh, <laughs> it does sort of wear on you. Um, but uh, so we'll also we'll, you know we'll be taking turns. So like mm -hmm. I might be logging. So Alan may be doing the talking, but I'll be writing down the call signs of the of the of the contacts that talk to us. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
and vice versa. All right, well, we can try to take another look at uh, the skies outside, but when I went out about 10 minutes ago, it wasn't looking overly promising, but uh, uh, I want to thank, first of all, Alan for uh, a great presentation. And uh, thank you all for, uh, for coming here today. Uh, next week, our speaker is going to be Zoe Lerner Pontario from Cornell's Astro uh, Physics Department talking about 20,000 leagues over the sea. Actually, hold on, give me a second. I'm going to get out of this presentation and go to our website. And um, our website is actually, you know, is another travel trove of, uh, of great information. So. Um, so tonight's program was, was on here. Next week is 20,000 Leagues Over in Alien Sea. So Zoe's going to talk about the, um, uh, the Europa mission that, is, uh, that they're working on at Cornell. And then the weekend after that, uh, a BU professor is going to talk about how tiny fossils can answer large questions about our Earth systems and how sh um, uh, this o you know, International Ocean Discovery Program uh, that she's worked on, uh, what we can get, take from that. And then one of our Copernic educators, uh, Robert Olaf Seegers, is going to talk about Neptune. So we're going to go back to uh, looking about astronomy. And then finally, um, what we've got scheduled is uh, Drew Williams from the Southern Tier Robotics uh, team. This is a group of high school students that build a competition robot that is literally almost maybe about two-thirds the size of that table that they then take to competitions. And they will bring that robot up here uh, to see. So. Uh, 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 that's always a lot of fun. So uh, anyway, thanks again for coming. We'll look forward to, uh, if you want, we'll take another peek outside, see if we can uh, look through the night sky, and uh, we'll see you soon.